All right, we've got some people coming in. Uh, welcome, guys. Let's give it a few more minutes and let everybody get in the room. But feel free to put in the chat where you're joining us from. And Julie is joining us from the West Coast today. Let's see what else do we have? Miami, Michigan. Oh, another West Coast. Ooh, Las Vegas. I bet the weather in Vegas has been as hot as Julie was saying that it's been in Southern California the past few weeks. <laughs> More. Getting a few more people in. Well, Richmond, Virginia, that's only about two hours from me. <laughs> well, to stay true to time, maybe we will go ahead and get started with a little bit of housekeeping here and people can still continue to roll in. Uh, before we get started, this webinar is being recorded. The recording and the slides will all be available. Uh, we will share it in an email after the webinar. If you do have any questions for Julie while the presentation is ongoing, please put them in the question and answer area of Zoom and we'll leave a little bit of time for those at the end. Before we get started, I just wanted to give a quick overview on what we do here at Bloomerang. We are a donor database system for all of your fundraising and management needs. If we haven't had the chance to meet before, I'm Kate Kramer, the Partner Marketing Manager at Bloomerang. We do have a really great promotion going on right now. I think we're going to put the link to it in the chat. So if you are interested in more information, but it is a buy now, pay in 2023, sort of an early Q4 promo. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to today's speaker. We are thrilled to have Julie Ha Trong for her third time presenting a Bluminar webinar. She is the founder of Leadership Savvy, and welcome back, Julie. All right, there we go. I can access the unmute button. That is my first test here. <laughs> Welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, yes, this is my third session with Boomerang and it's always really fun to work with the team. Uh, the team is always uh, a partner with me. They don't just say, hey, Julie, here's the topic and let's go for it. But it's really a partnership on what our nonprofit uh, professionals seeing in the field and what topics can we bring to you that are more, most helpful? So it's been really a pleasure bringing different topics to the conversation. So thanks for having me again today. I'm going to share screen so that everyone can follow along. Uh, today's topic is one of those broader topics, but boy, is it really important in our everyday lives. Uh, we can always have wonderful plans laid, but if we're unable to uh, work with others uh, and uh, be really solid leaders, and in in not only leading others, but also leading ourselves, it's going to be difficult or we're going to feel like there's still something missing, right? And it just becomes work. And hey, none of us went into this field just for it to be work, right? We're all uh, passionate people here who want to do good in the world. So hopefully this seminar allows us uh, to do more of that. So here's the topic, leadership today, key skills and career job tips. Why I'm here in front of you today is that um, I run a leadership consulting firm. I work with leaders on helping you figure out how to take your mission and work with others to define very clear priorities and the steps to put it into action. 
So um, it's, it's been a joy working with a range of nonprofit organizations uh, from health to education, to arts, to the environment, to senior citizens, to veteran services, workforce development. Uh, it's been a real joy because I manage a lot of partnership programs. I get to work cross-sectorally and even across uh, the way with corporate partners even. So just a little bit about myself uh, on the slide here. I've led a lot of networks and had to lead, lead public policy efforts. And so um, as we talk about leadership today, I wanted to, to know that I've worked with different types of leaders, community-based members, as well as higher level officials. Um, a few things that might be helpful for you to know, and later on, we'll have a chance to do a Q&A so you can ask me more questions about it or connect with me after today if, there, if you feel like you do similar work and would like to uh, connect. Um, I've worked on cross-sector collaborations and reforming education systems. That was 100 different partners helping, not just to help the students, but their families and perhaps more importantly, the teachers, right? And so they also work really hard to build up our communities. Um, then I moved into leadership development, hosting trainings and conferences. And uh, most recently, before I opened my own firm three years ago, I did executive recruiting and helped that company launch a whole set of consulting services from strategic planning to mergers and acquisitions. So I consider myself like an executive consultant generalist at this point. It's been 20 years in my career and it's been a blast and I look forward to the next 20. So today what we'll cover is leading through uncertainty. Uh, we, we are on the heels of, of the pandemic. Uh, what are some of those modern leadership skills that uh, organizations are looking for and, and can be very helpful? How to move from management to leadership and increasing your uh, executive presence and influence. And finally, um, really using that to circle back on your career trajectory. How do you position your own interest for your career next steps. So lately we've been talking a lot about uh, the great resignation or the great reshuffle. Uh, I think during the crisis, I did see a lot of organizations and individuals react very differently. We had some that put their hand, head in the sand, right? And said, when is this all going to blow over? Uh, we had some folks who said, this is a moment where we can innovate. This is some, a point where our clients need us more than ever. Uh, so let's get creative and uh, totally redesign how we do what we do. Then we had the folks who were, who were kind of in the middle, right? Kind of, kind of waiting to see how things would play out and then taking very cautious steps to continue to stay uh, afloat and stay relevant and pivot in, in kind of the slow and measured manner. So we saw a range of organizations do different things. I'm sure as you reflect on your own experience too, you can see which one of those you were, where you are on the spectrum. Uh, and now that we're emerging from uh, this pandemic or this new normal now, uh, we can see some organizations uh, have completely changed how they do business because they've learned a lot through the pandemic. Some organizations are trying to figure out, do we go back to what we did before? Uh, and really the answer is no, we can't. Uh, the world has changed and employees are uh, expecting uh, different ways of being able to work and our clients may have different priorities too. So it's been from a consulting standpoint, working with a number of organizations, this is a really interesting time. Nonprofits, professionals have changing priorities. And so this is a, a very unique opportunity for us as a sector us as organizational leaders to take a pause and do some real reflection and planning with those that we work with. And I encourage you to broaden those that you talk with, make it very participatory, include all of your diverse stakeholders, take this moment to really listen to what people are interested in, not just what they need, but what they are interested in and ready to work with you on. So many times us as nonprofit leaders, we look at data and we do needs assessments, uh, but we don't take the extra step of doing a readiness assessment. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from today is write down the word readiness assessment. That is an extra step, an extra lens to see just because a community needs this, are they really ready to address it? And in those answers, you will have 
a lot more clarity on how to move forward to be able to um, work with that, that demographic. Finally, I just wanted to mention that yes, organizations have always done strategic planning, but lately I've been seeing um, many organizations and leaders take another um, moment to do scenario planning. So many organizations have different types of leaders, right? Some leaders are, let's be nurturing, let's take let's um, take very intentional steps to slowly grow and make sure there's buy-in and that there's no burnout right i've worked with those type of leaders then there are some very pioneering leaders that want to double and triple numbers and grow exponentially right it's two very different types of of uh, leadership growth trajectories uh, not one is better than the other necessarily right yes i'm going to announce to the hundreds of people in this room I am 40 now. So what I've learned in my 40 years is I used to be biased. I used to really think good leadership is when things are growing in a very impressive pace. But now that I've been a consultant, I'm 40, I've worked with different types of leaders, both types of leaderships are viable. And it's important to know what type of leader you are. Are you the slow and steady or are you that pioneering leader? And being aware of that can help you see how you lead your team. Do you have a team who has that type of culture? Are the individuals on your team similar to you or different? And that can inform you how you can best work with your team. Now, where the scenario planning comes in is once we have this awareness, we should no longer assume that one particular path is better or correct or more successful. And so what I'm seeing organizations do with scenario planning is actually asking themselves, what does success and what does growth look like for us? And usually they're thinking about not just now, but like three to five years into the future, what does success look like? Is it growing exponentially, doubling, tripling the number of clients? Is it opening more facilities? Is it going statewide? Is it going national, international, right? Is that like geographically growing? Uh, or is it going deeper, making sure that what we do is truly transformative to the clients that we serve, to the people that we work with? And so one organization I've worked with more recently, they originally had this very aggressive growth trajectory, expanding to double the amount of institutions they would work with when they realized the 2000 girls that they've already served really need them in a deeper way. And so they now changed their next three to five year growth strategy to include a deep amount of social emotional learning and mental health support. So um, it's very exciting. If we could take a moment to really think about how do we define success and growth, you might be able to try out different scenarios and speak with the stakeholders, speak with those that you serve which one truly means meaningful impact for them, right? So um, uncertainty is scary, but it's a wonderful time to bring everyone together and reassess what are we doing and where are we trying to go and how do we get there? Ah, so this process I've mapped, if you do it in that way where it's inclusive, and thoughtful, uh, you will end up with a plan that people are already excited to implement. 70% of change initiatives fail, mostly because people just, they don't support it, right? How many times has a leader or a manager come and say, oh, I'm so excited. You know, we're going to implement this new process, this new tool, we, we have a new partner, um, and they're so excited. And as an employee or a partner, we're like, I should be excited about this, but I have trepidation in my heart. How is this going to impact me and my teams? Do we have the resource to do this? I can't even ma like manage my current workload. How am I going to add that onto my plate? These questions are actually not negative questions. We need to reframe how we think of questions. These questions are healthy. It means that you are actively interested and you are processing the information. 
And so as leaders and managers, we need to remember that when we are managing change or asking people to think differently, that oftentimes we've already had the time to sit with that idea. We've already asked ourselves all of those questions. What if we were to try that? What if we were to do this? Do we have the resources for that? We've already gone through that process, probably even talked with our peers and our teams and our partners and everyone at that level is on board. But when we roll it out, suddenly people seem so negative and inquisitive. And so I invite you to think about their questions as active engagement. And even if their tone doesn't seem like they're celebrating right away, build in time, build in time to allow them to have that time to ask questions, to gain more context and to understand truly why this change makes sense. Uh, and if it doesn't, you know, they're gonna ask helpful questions that help you get to a better spot anyways. So that when you do come up with the app action implementation plan, they're on board, right? And so of course, this is assuming that they weren't part of the original participatory process in you know, designing or conceptualizing uh, the change. Uh, but remember, any change process, yes, is hard. And yes, people might have pushback, but oftentimes it's because they just haven't had the time or received the amount of context they need to feel comfortable with it, or at least comfortable with the unknown, right? And, and they can see, okay, there is some benefit here. And um, let's, let's try it together. All right, so this slide is about uh, what type of modern leaderships organizations are looking for. The Center for Creative Leadership uh, does a lot of research on what organizations are currently seeking and what skills leaders have uh, that they're bringing to the table and what skills that, that may be a, a little bit weak and that as a sector, we need to foster more. So these are four skills that they've highlighted as being very important to the future leaders of our sector and our areas that we need to better kind of prepare and train and, al and allow our leaders to exercise these skills. And so the four are inspiring commitment, the ability to lead employees, engage in strategic planning and change management. And so there are a few ways in which we can help our current leaders or to elevate your leadership to be able to um, practice these modern leadership skills. So to inspire commitment, one of the things that we often think are inspiring leaders are people who have great presence or are on social media, right? Or they have bold, amazing visions. Those are just one type of leaders. Again, now that I'm a little older, I can see there are different types of leaders that can be successful. And so one tip that's really helped me as I work with different leaders and as I work to foster different leaders uh, there's the concept of competency versus charisma. I would say the majority of our ability to be effective in our jobs and in our service to the community are the relationships that we have. And how those relationships are built are often through this competency versus charisma lens. Some of you, you'll, I hopefully, as I describe it, you'll see yourselves immediately. When you meet someone new, are you interested in first hearing about all about their credentials? Or are you more interested in hearing about their story and how they got there, what they're really about on the inside? There are two types of people. Some people, like when you come to this seminar and listen to me, you probably took a quick look at is Julie Hatron really the founder of Leadership Savvy? And what type of organizations has she worked with? Is it even worth my time to come and listen to her? And for other people, they're like, am I going to fall asleep in this seminar? Or is Julie going to be entertaining, warm and friendly and tell stories that I can relate to, right? So some of you are going to be more competency focused and some will be more charisma focused. And so um, over the years, um, you're going to realize there's both types of professionals you'll work with. And so for you to best prepare for any interaction with other individuals, couple steps. One, know if you are a charisma person, right? The people person, the feeler, the empathy, or are you more of a competency focused person? 
You want data. You want evidence, right? You want concreteness. Um, and then the per people that you interact with, where do they come from? What, what is their preferred um, way of communicating? preferred way of working. Uh, and I, I, I now realize that there are some people that work really well with systems and data and structure and having a very thorough thought out plan, right? Those are my competency folks. You guys love to check those boxes and say, okay, this is how we're gonna do the work. This is how we're allocating all the resources. You are my perfect planners. But then there are others who no, they're not just, they're not gonna engage in a bunch of spreadsheets, right? They're, they would quit if their entire job was just spreadsheets. For those people having five to 10 minutes of social interaction before a meeting or some sort of interactive activity or workshop during a staff meeting, that's how they really connect with their peers. So make sure that you're making time for both as you work with teams, especially if you are newer to working with them. Once you've worked with them for a while, you're going to know. You're going to you're going to know the culture of your team and of your teammates. And then you'll be able to tailor your leadership strategy, your facilitation approach, your talking points to best need, meet their needs. Uh, all right. So that is one way that we can inspire commitment by understanding what others find inspiring. And it's not always the same, right? So as we lead employees, our ultimate goal is that they feel so empowered that they are proactive. They are problem solvers. They will make it work, even if things are unclear or resources are short. And so what is behind motivation? That is a very difficult uh, goal to reach for and sometimes to measure, but I have, um, I have a, a solution. So in many research studies, they use slightly different terms for these, but uh, it, it's pretty consistent that it's these three themes that help people feel more motivated. They have to have a sense of autonomy, that they're not being told very specifically what to do, that it isn't just micromanagement, that there is some autonomy in how they do the work. Number two, mastery. They might not know exactly how to do the work right now, but there is a potential there that they could learn a new skill or they could be really good at, it, good at it. Mastery can also be folks who already know how to do something well and so they're like, oh, that'd be easy. Yeah, I can surely, I can do that, right? So a sense of mastery or potential mastery. And the third thing is relatedness. Do they have a sense of personal connection and relation to the effort? Uh, and, and so that almost is like a purpose. Do they understand the purpose behind uh, this activity or this project? And so when you have those three things, naturally people will feel more motivated to work on it. All right, let's move on to strategic planning. I've already talked about strategic planning because it is one of those things that is really an anchor tool for our sector. And what we what we see is a lot of executive leaders or as people are moving up the leadership ladder, not everybody is a long term strategic thinker right thinking about how to create. Systems that will last a long time, not just take you through the year and and meet all your deliverables but is a system that will be built that will last hopefully three to five years, right? It will just, some, you're, you're starting something that will be institutionalized. And so that long-term systems thinking is really important. And strategic plans usually cover three to five years. What I'd like to share here is the traditional way of doing strategic planning was where boards of directors would talk with the few key staff or key, key experts and have a board retreat. And then after three hours, they have an amazing strategic plan, great visions, uh, and then they pass it on to staff. I believe those days are over. Strategic plans are an, a very important time for organizations and leaders to gain more diverse input 
from a wide range of stakeholders and to assess what the market needs are. And only through that can you get outside of your day-to-day -day people and knowledge and systems to see what other possibilities might be. And it's within those broader possibilities, those broader visions that are painted, that is when you start to say, oh, maybe what we have now and what got us here is not necessarily what will get us there. And that's when you start to do those strategic pivots and you start to commit to some really exciting things that can take you three, five, seven years from now. The reason why not everyone thinks this way is because the majority of our staff are direct service or managers. Uh, and we need to start allowing more of our managers and really other community stakeholders to be a part of the planning process. Again, we believe in planning, we invest in planning. Let's use it as an opportunity to train more levels of our staff and to include our community in the planning process. I think that is how we train the next generation of leaders to be strategic thinkers. And so I encourage you to go back. If you haven't been part of a planning process, to, to use this Bloomerang seminar as an excuse, to use me as an excuse, I attended the seminar and I really want to learn more about longer term thinking and strategic planning and how management decisions are make, made. Uh, and so hopefully you can start being invited, um, even if you're not on the committee, but to have some insight and input into the planning processes. And finally, uh, just a reminder, when we're managing change, be patient with yourself, be patient with those that you're working with. People need context and time. So, so many leaders are very hard on themselves. If, it just, if the announcement didn't go well, they think they totally bombed it. But that's not the case. It just may be that people had immediate visceral reactions, uh, but give them some time to process and be there with them to be able to help them, guide them along, because it's only gonna help clarify your strategic thinking as you explain it to them and be open. Maybe their questions will lead you somewhere that will take you to a, an even more uh, effective place. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. I think this is like our second to the last slide and then um, we'll open it up for questions. So feel free to um, have some questions in mind to put in the chat box. This is a bit of a self-assessment. Uh, so far I've been talking about what modern leadership skills look like, motivating our teams, uh, being self-aware about our leadership styles, and um, being strategic thinkers. Uh, and so as so I was a recruiter for three years, but I was also a leadership trainer um, for most of my career actually. And we would hold um, two jobs ago, we would hold a lot of trainings, conferences, and actually certificate programs to help folks get certificates in leadership, management, uh, working with boards of directors, or even program evaluation. And so I can see the range of skills that are needed to really be effective leaders in the nonprofit sector. It's one of the reasons I like to work in the nonprofit sector is the range of, of skill sets that we, we can learn about and can actually apply. Uh, and I, so I, I think for those of us who, live, who work in small to mid-sized organizations, it can feel like really heavy and that we have too many things on our plate. But also if we take a step back, what an incredible opportunity to learn many different facets of an organization. And so I would say the first 10 years of my life was working with small to mid-sized organizations and that absolutely those skills I was able to apply to the larger institutions and coalitions that I worked with. So this is a short list of some key areas in which uh, at, as you climb the leadership ladder uh, are really important skill areas to not necessarily develop yourself, but to look at and see what do you really enjoy, could see yourself doing well, and what are areas of weakness uh, that you'd like to learn more about or know something about yourself, right? That I'm gonna be in a leadership role, but here are a couple areas where I don't think I should take that on. I should have a colleague 
who's passionate about those things, right? Because it can be unreasonable to expect everyone to know all of these facets. Uh, and, and so uh, this chart here, the self-assessment is a way for you to think about which areas you want to specialize in, which areas you'd like to have team members specialize in. Uh, and it's always healthy to know a little bit about everything so that you can help guide and supervise and provide um, partnership on. So real quick, the top one is, um, oh, and one more note, that little uh, phrase at the top, from management to leadership. Because this is about leadership, um, I'm encouraging you to move one step up towards the leadership mindset. Management really is about doing and meeting the deliverables at hand for maybe the, the month, the year. And leadership is helping a team and an organization or even bigger, like a coalition uh, or a policy effort, think longer term. And so one way uh, to understand if you are seen as a manager versus a leader is as we go through this bullet, bulleted list here is think about, do people come to you for specific execution items on each of these? Or do people come to you to strategize about higher level opportunities? So for example, organizational priorities and strategies. Do they come to you to understand the quarterly benchmarks, right? Very specific uh, for maybe a department or team and what are the tactics around that? Or do, they, do people tend to come to you and say, hey, um, we have like a health policy coalition trying to think about how to best utilize the members in that coalition, right? And um, how we can help them come up with their strategic priorities, right? It's a higher level conversation. Uh, and so then you can start to see, do you serve in more of a management role of that effort or more in a leadership role? Uh, and uh, as, you, as you step into leadership roles, we're go you're going to have to change uh, the way you focus on what is what is success in your role uh, for that particular item and it can be difficult because in our sector what we do is we take good managers and we promote them into leaders but we don't really support them to think strategically or or give them the tools to be better leaders so right now it's just about this self-assessment tool here is about awareness uh, so the next uh, big air category is strategic relations are you somebody that builds relations just to manage a specific project? Or are you thinking longer term and making these broader network connections, right? Internally and externally. A classic example is, are you building relationships with your teammates and maybe your peers, but neglecting to build relationships with across departments or with senior executives, right? So I always say you wanna build relations up, down and around. And then uh, it can be easy to just stay engaged with the people you work with immediately, but there are external relations too that can be very helpful for you to foster and be able to be seen uh, as a thought leader in your particular field. Operationally, uh, similarly, right? Um, what is your role? in working with staff and managing HR, uh, financial management, uh, mitigating risk and compliance. Uh, some of you may have direct work related to these areas, others may not. And so as you step into leadership roles, it's good to also know enough about operations uh, because that really helps your organization stabilize over time. And then the last two are more external. Uh, external affairs, marketing, fundraising, advocacy, and then understanding the sector trends. Who are the key players? And what are, what are some policies coming down the pipeline? What funding is associated with it? In our sector, the nonprofit sector, we have a lot of funding trends that happen, right? Some key words, whether it's homelessness or a social emotional wealth or moving from mental health to behavioral health, these are all terms that if you're on, if you're in the field and you are a key player, you should know about these trends. And then within those are micro trends, right? And so 
keeping your, your eyes and ears open to these trends are really important. Do you do that? Or are you only researching what your immediate needs are? Um, so, uh, so these are all five different areas that as you're approaching more executive leadership roles or senior leadership roles, these are really good skills to have. And I'm gonna challenge you and push you just one more layer, not just having experience in those areas, but moving from a management mindset and bridging that to a leadership mindset. All right, so um, this can be your homework assignment, right? Um, actually taking some time to write down where your experiences are in these different areas. Do you like doing that work? Or do you not like doing that work, right? Do you want to learn more or would you rather pass the baton? All right, so I think this is the final um, topic here. So after you're doing that self-assessment, you should have a much better sense of, of who you are, right? Oftentimes our resumes, our resumes say what we did, which is great. That's a snapshot in time. It documents our jobs and what we did, but often doesn't share what you enjoyed about it and what you are really proud of. And so I would encourage you to elevate those to, to like higher up on your resume and take a moment to truly ask yourself, what brings you joy in your job? Is it managing people? Is it ensuring there's adequate finances? Is it building out new systems that people actually utilize, right? Uh, and then those become what you, what you pursue, what you ask for more opportunities in, and you become known for those things. Uh, and what areas do you have the skills to be able to do this work or where might there be gaps? Uh, and so you may want to go back and uh, go to school and gain more skills in that area, or you might want to learn on the job or in a volunteer capacity. So uh, getting you closer and closer to aligning your interests, what you want to do, and your skills, what you're capable of doing, right? And then when those two uh, meet, that's what you want to amplify into the world. This is what I want to be known for. And so as I coach leaders, as I coach or uh, do career coaching, I always say, choose three buckets. Right? Choose three general areas that you want to be known for. So for example, I love career coaching. So that's one bucket. Another one is uh, working on collaborations and partnerships, right? And then the third one is diverse communities. So those are three buckets. The, beautiful of, the beauty of today's world is you can adjust, you can pilot, you can pivot. So as you put things out into the world, either on your resume, on LinkedIn, on your blog, YouTube videos, whatever platform, or even as you network with people one-on-one, -on -one, what you talk about, how you talk about what you do, stick to those three buckets. And as you talk about it, you'll hear yourself and see if it feels right. Because in a few months, if it doesn't feel right and you want to reframe it, you can do that, right? But what I'm encouraging here is for you to take ownership of your story, not just what the resume says, but taking ownership of what you're proud of and what you want to share with the world. And that from that, you're gonna see different options emerge, um, either formally or informally. It can be in your current job and you can advocate for, for yourself earlier. I said, ask to be a part of strategic planning, right? Or join a board of directors at another organization and be a volunteer. And through that, you can learn about strategy and fundraising as well. Uh, and then obviously the one that people always gravitate towards is, is there a new job opportunity that I could pursue, right? So different paths to get there. So again, putting your story out there, claiming your story, what do you want to be known for and do? And just try it on, stick to those three buckets for a while um, and, and update your resume uh, to better reflect what you want, not just who you were, uh, and put it out there on social media. For me, social media is do what works for you. I am not gonna tell you to post five times a day, not even every day, but if you don't post right now, like maybe once a month could be a good start, right? But do something that's manageable for you. Um, stay focused on those buckets and have fun 
when you're networking, have stories at the ready. If, if Julie says she likes coaching, partnerships, and diversity, I better have a story for each ready to tell you, right, that I'm proud to share with you. So I, I want you to have those stories in your back pocket. And again, pursue those formal and informal opportunities. And don't forget, celebrate, reflect, and share with yourself, with your peers, with people who support you, right? Let them be your cheerleaders and your critical thought partners uh, and put it out there into the world. Because I really believe in putting things in the universe and it happens, like the universe hears us. It's very powerful, but really I think it's just, we're all in this together and we want each other to be successful. So as we share our hopes and dreams and our, our exciting stories, people gravitate towards that and they want, they want to help, we want to help each other uh, be able to do more of that good work uh, in our sector. So thank you so much for having me today. Uh, hopefully there were a couple nuggets or things that you could relate to uh, in my presentation and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Julie. I think we do have a few questions in our Q&A box. Um, one participant said, the leader missed the opportunity to engage and involve the staff in thinking out loud about future change. Can the leader recapture this opportunity before the change is implemented? That has certainly happened to me. <laughs> we, uh, the organization I was with did a uh, restructure, which they had never done, right? So none of us would have expected this. And three minutes before it was going to be announced, I was a senior manager, like I was, I was in the executive team. They called me in and said, Julie, I just wanna personally tell you that we're gonna have a restructure and we're launching it in one minute. You know, <laughs> So when we, when we announce it, do we have your vote, right? So I'm supposed to feel grateful that they told me one minute before, but I, I was not, I was not able to um, genuinely provide my wholehearted support and the rest of the staff reflected that. I've definitely been, been, been in that situation. And so a good leader, uh, yes, they probably uh, would go back and be a little upset. The rest of the staff was not on board. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, people need time. There always is an opportunity to go back and tell the team, I'm sorry, it was a little bit abrupt how we announced that. Let's sit down and talk about it. Let's do a little bit of planning. Let's figure out if this restructure makes sense. Why or why not? Again, the staff don't know why um, the restructure was decided upon this way. And as staff ask questions, maybe they'll realize, you know, that team doesn't need as much resources here. They actually need more resources over here. So we're still gonna have a restructure, but it might look a little different. And so yes, leaders, whenever there's a moment where things are falling apart, you definitely have an opportunity to say, let's have a session and let's regroup. Um, and you don't need to do it on your own. I think that's the, that's the heavy burden a lot of leaders have and put on themselves. Um, try and have a team that plans it with you. Next question. Awesome. Okay, now we have, which of the modern leadership skills is utmost for iteration during scaling up? Mm. I always go back to that strategic plan. And so remember the old plans are visions with a lot of like kumbaya handshakes and then staff have to just figure it out. Um, good plans should be inclusive and also have an implementation plan and so you have it broken down by year uh, and by quarter and so that template becomes your iteration tool so every team every department has their own strategic implementation plan and every quarter they should very intentionally look at that and see are we on track does this still make sense what needs to be adjusted and the two lenses that I constantly um, use when we talk about iteration is capacity and funding. Uh, and so based on the plan that we have set forth, do we still have the capacity and resources to be able to do it? And if not, you're gonna need to make adjustments. You have to adjust the scope of it, the timeline of it, right? Or drop it. 
Thank you. Okay, next we have what reading materials do you recommend to help us elevate ourselves from a manager to a leadership level? Mm, that's a really good question. Let me see if I can grab a couple. Um, let's see. I did not know you guys were going to ask me this great question, but I, I have some good books here. Um, the first one is a fun read. Um, it's called Untamed by Glennon Doyle. And it basically gives you permission to go and be a leader and uh, be a firecracker. <laughs> so this is a really fun read. Uh, this is a more practical how-to to do strategic planning and gives you a lot of the tools that I've been alluding to, like step-by-step, -step, the templates are here. Uh, so strategic planning for nonprofit organizations. I'm trying to see who wrote it. Michael Allison and Jude K. And then finally, I really like this one. It's called uh, The 100X Leader. This is really about understanding how to get to your 100% so that you can lead others. And um, one, one tool they use in here is called Five Voices. And Five Voices, is really helpful to understand the type of leader you are, which culture you like to work in, and how, how to translate your language into somebody other, someone else's preferred culture. So in the five voices, they look at uh, the pioneers, the guardians, the connectors, the creator, creatives, right? And the nurturers, and how these five different ways of being and leading um, sometimes can clash with each other. But when you have a better sense of who you are and the others that you're working with, um, there's some really easy wins to help elevate um, all types of leaders. So um, the 100X leader, uh, ooh. Can you read that or is it backwards? <laughs> Jeremy Kubik. K-U-B-I-C-E-K and Steve Cockrum. So uh, five voices. They have an online survey for free too, where you can find out what your preferred leadership voice is. Wonderful. I'm going to add some of those to my Amazon list. <laughs> Okay, and our final question is, um, as a new member of a substance abuse fundraising team, what advice would you give to someone new to the field who is very driven? Mm. There's so many opportunities, so many paths. So uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, so there's different ways of developing our skill sets from getting more credentials, right? That would be your competency side. And then the charisma side is the networking, getting comfortable with networking. And so uh, the easiest one is to start with the uh, people that are closest to you or most similar. So other fundraising associations or other substance abuse related or tangential organizations and connecting with those people. That will help you elevate uh, both your competency and your charisma skills. Uh, to be able to work uh, in this field. Uh, and then having a mentor outside the organization can really be helpful to be your sounding board to, for you to be able to ask those difficult questions. I know on the job for us, it can be scary to have all of these ups and downs or questions and we feel like we can't really ask anyone, right? We don't want, sometimes we don't want our colleagues to know that we're having like a mental breakdown <laughs> or we're having a moment of self-doubt. To have a colleague on the outside to say, have you been through this? Or who, is there anyone I can talk to can, can be really reassuring. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Julie. We we're so glad to have you back. And I think uh, we're going to have a poll up in just a moment if it's not already. Actually, I think it is up. So anybody who would like to take that, we would certainly appreciate it. And we, we also um, are going to send the slides out. So on that last slide uh, is my contact information. If you want to follow me and all of my kind of consulting and work tips, uh, it's on LinkedIn. But if you want to follow my, my travel adventures, I work remotely a lot. So you'll see me and my family on our uh, 
we updated our truck to have a pop-up tent, water heater, solar system, so I can work right on the road, literally. Uh, feel free to follow me on Instagram. Oh, that's at, awesome. Yeah, and Julie Hatrong. I think we just dropped your uh, LinkedIn link in the chat, as well as a reminder that we'll be back with another thought leadership webinar next Thursday. So thank you again, Julie, and thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. <laughs>